Well, thank you very much, uh, Eric and Amartya. Uh, we'll have just a, a few minutes for uh, for for discussion. Uh, it's running a little late, so I know a few of you have to leave. So uh, if you want to leave quietly. Uh, um, let me let me just uh, begin with with just a, a, a couple questions. Uh, for, first, for for uh, Eric, in terms of um, uh, he made it seem very plausible that the single peakedness condition, uh, the the preferences in the example you gave would be satisfied, but uh, that assumes that there is. Uh, only uh, one dimension, left, right, and we have, we know we have like social conservatives and, and we might have uh, human rights or some other two dimensions. And once you get into two dimensions, uh, that doesn't work, does it? It, it certainly, the, the, the case that in, that in two or more dimensions, single peakness by itself is, is not going to ensure that majority rule uh, is is transitive. Uh, as it happens, there are uh, other conditions besides single peakness, and, and, and actually, Martia was was instrumental in, in showing what they what they are. Uh, to, that that will guarantee decisiveness. Uh, of, of majority rule, uh, and and in some cases, in in, in two dimensions, we can expect yeah, can. Th these more general conditions to hold. But I, I think the point I was trying to make is not that uh, uh, that's that single peakness or any other conditions are are necessarily likely to hold in practice. Uh, in, in, in any particular instance, but that the, the same problems that, 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 that is if majority rule runs into problems, every other voting rule is going to run into problems as well. So, so there, there's a sense in, uh, in which we can't do better than majority that, that, rule in avoiding go. problems. Go yeah, well, I, I think that's um, exactly right what um, Eric said. That is Basically, uh, it's a very exciting theorem, that's what uh, the one uh, that Eric presented. The, uh, what it is showing is that majority rule is, the, in this sense, the best, the most robust in terms of satisfying these conditions of all the voting rules. If there's a gloom around the majority rule, my God, the gloom is greater for the others. That's, the, right. that's what the domination theorem yeah. is. Yeah. Um, and but I was asking how, how optimistic or pessimistic overall I, it is. Well, exactly. That, but, that, but that's going to depend. I think that's going to depend on the setting. We yeah. we, we can't answer that in in full generality. In in Florida, uh, majority work. rule would have worked very nicely. Yeah. I mean, I think <laughs> <laughs> if you Florida would work. I mean, one way of understanding it is to take. Take somebody who is completely outside this, namely Karl Marx. If you take the world according to the Communist Manifesto, it is going to be majority rule is working just fine. The two classes workers have nothing to lose other than their chain, <laughs> and they happen to be no m m more numerous, and they're going to um, get the capitalists seized up, if but for the, uh, their greater power in other respect. On the other hand, if you take Marx of, take the other extreme, 18 Brumaire of Louis Bonaparte, where there are almost 180 different classes in this extremely complicated relationship, I think you will violate all the conditions pretty robustly. <laughs> uh, so I think it depends on the nature. That's the one point, and Eric, I agree entirely with what Eric said there. The, the point I would add to X is that if you're dealing with wealth economics, then we need some other characteristic of which, you know, which are, where the majority rule may not win hands down, in fact. Uh, I mean, uh, one way of thinking about it is that um, if you are concerned with minority rights, 
there are occasions that you simply would like to violate the majority rule. In the cases where the majority is dealing with an affair, where the minorities uh, are really the interesting thing, like the, when it, if you're dealing with, to move from Marx to Mill, if you're moving from utilitarianism to own liberty, if you're dealing with the territory of freedom of religion, of freedom to pursue a different lifestyle, and then if the lifestyle happened to be of these guys, then they should win over the majority, uh, as Mill put it, there's no parity between the strength of the preference of the person whose life it is compared with the strength of the preference of somebody who wants to, who is offended by these persons leading their own lives. So I think uh, there are many other contexts, it wouldn't be the, the right way of proceeding uh, at all. And indeed, the, 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 I referred briefly to my impossibility of poetry and liberal. It began with that thought, that there must be some cases when majority rule, even if it were transit, I was, I was working, and they just doing the necessary sufficient condition then uh, of majority rule to say, that, well, suppose we would satisfy that, well, still that class of cases is telling us nothing at all about it. So I think Eric's point about it depends on what kind of exercise it is, is extremely important. And what is it that you're trying to get out? A plausible majority winner? Protection of the basic rights of human beings? The, something which you could describe as a greater social welfare? They're all different problems. And the axiomatic structure had to be different. Yeah. It's the tribute to the axiomatic method that you can apply to all of them but the shortcut in the axiomatic method, one axiom, that fits all. It's not going to work. Okay. Could, I, could I just add one follow-up to that? Uh, when I, in my discussion, I was imposing the, the axiom that all candidates should be treated equally. That seems utterly plausible and desirable in a case of a political election where we don't want to rig the rules in favor of one candidate or the other. But when, we're, when, when the candidates are, for example, social policies, and some social policies are going to have particular effects for on minority groups, say, then the idea of treating all social policies in an even-handed way would no longer be so plausible. And, and so, so, as Mark just said, the, the axioms themselves will depend, which axioms are appropriate will depend on the particular setting. Good. Yeah, I, I, another question that was raised actually by both your talks, but especially by Mark's, which is, uh, um, First, that in, in uh, uh, the context of, of many so, uh, situations like government committees that I've been on, uh, you never use majority voting. Uh, it's always by consensus. And uh, uh, most families don't run by uh, majority voting. Uh, and they certainly don't satisfy the other axioms. Uh, some of them particularly the dictatorship one. Um, <laughs> but uh, uh, two questions. One, do you want to speculate about why that is? And the second one, which is related to a remark you made, which is that um, it, in the context of uh, a lot of the social context of making decisions, uh, there are these public dialogues where you try to listen to other people's preferences and somehow uh, when you come to make a decision, you incorporate their preferences in your voting behavior in some sense, you know, or in how you think about it, which is very much outside of this very individualistic approach which, which uh, underlies Ken's work. Do you, do you want to, these are just speculations or, but I, Yeah. Well, I, I, to say it underlies Kent's work, with that, I, I was in total agreement with you until that point. Oh. I mean, he was, I mean, Guy was writing a PhD thesis, right? Yeah, yeah, no. <laughs> and in that work, he wasn't. But there are other work where he's yeah, very, yeah, I mean, very aware of the importance of consensus. But it is true, I, I did say that in, if you think about one basic idea that people pursue, it's more 
James Buchanan territory than Canal territory for reasons that are very similar to that of Condorcet, I, I think, namely that we influence each other and we come to understand. It's not only that we take into account the ideas, but we understand each other. We always, any, any public debate, and that's quite big in my by new book, The Idea of Justice, uh, every public debate is an educational exercise. You see, I think it's worth remembering one example. It's often taught that Robert Malthus, Thomas Robert Malthus, was the first to talk about overpopulation. The first person to talk about was, in fact, Condorcet. And he discussed that the world could become so, so thickly populated that people won't be able to feed each other. If you feed, I mean, there, there can't be food for all. And then he said, well, he pointed a little to technological progress, one of the first to do so. But then he said, well, is it, any, is it at all likely this will happen? And he said, no, it's not likely. Why? A, because people would reason that if there's a crisis generated by this, they will find a reasonable way of solving it. I mean, what you get there is on one side the Enlightenment reliance on, 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 on reasoning's power by Condorcet, and Malthus has complete belief that reasoning plays no part. It's only when people start dying that population comes down. Um, but then Condorcet did a twist that we, we have discussion on that, and that's why education is very important. Condorcet was one of the first to argue about the importance of female education. And one of the interesting things is that if we look at, um, this is some really empirical statistics of some relevance to us, I think, <laughs> to that particular debate. That is, if you take the, all the districts in, in India and you look at fertility rates, the, the most important determinant of lower fertility, fertility rate in that time, these are 1981, 1979, 1971, 81, 91 census, the, the fertility rate to start with varies between a five and a half children per <coughs> family to 1.7 children per family. One is way below replacement and the other is many times that. The, the only two factors of statistical significance are women's education and women's, uh, women's uh, independent employment, to earn uh, gainful employment. Both these had a feature of increasing women's voice. Women's education is the strongest of them but because it also has a feature of people learning from each other. It's, you, know, you go to school, you chat with people, you get exposed to ideas and so on. And you get influence by that. And one of the interesting things is that if you take family by family comparison of education healthcare, you don't get that result. When you do it village by village, you get a stronger result, district by district even stronger. What's happening is that you have to chat with people <laughs> in order to do that. Sole person, woman educated in the village doesn't do very much for herself or anyone else, but when there is a community going on. So, central to it is conversation and reasoning and public reasoning. And in some ways, we often forget that the Enlightenment tradition, which has become very fashionable now to, uh, to, 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 to blast it and, and, and argue that that generated all the ills in the world, but it emphasized not only the importance of reasoning, but reasoning together. And I think that's very closely connected with the idea of consensus. And if Condorcet was not that pessimistic, he thought that we were going to get there. But as a matter of fact, that's what happened. Condorcet's own life was a tragedy. He expected much more consensus in the French Revolution. <laughs> <laughs> this did not happen. It was quite clear that he was in a minority at a time when the minority rights were not respected for the Maskinian reasons that we just now heard. <laughs> <laughs> and as a result, he killed himself when it was absolutely clear that if he hadn't, then the others would do it for him. Yeah. And so that was a huge issue. So he didn't win as it, more, as it happened there. On the other hand, in terms of looking at the world today, 
I think it's very difficult to think of civility, political civility in the world where democratic system works. It doesn't work only on the basis of majority decisions. Exactly. Yeah. It works on a much wider thing. Did, could, Ken, did Ken neglect it in his PhD thesis? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> did he name, does he neglect it in general? No. <laughs> I, I agree with what uh, Amartya just said. I just a, a, a brief uh, uh, elaboration on the, the, the point about unanimity, uh, consensus. Uh, I, consensus, I think, uh, is is used especially and and is most effective in settings where. Uh, although people may differ in their uh, uh, probabilistic assessments uh, of what is the, the likely outcome, they all share the same uh, goal. And, and, and the classic uh, example of this is, is a criminal jury. Criminal juries work, uh, at least in this country, uh, by consensus. You, you, the verdict has to be unanimous, and and the and the theory, uh, which is which I think is confirmed by by practice, is that even though the jurors come into the jury room with perhaps widely uh, differing probability probabilistic assessments of guilt or innocence based on what they've heard, they can talk things through. This comes back to, yeah, to conversation. Yeah. They can talk things through, they can share information, and because they all have the same goal in the end, uh, consensus will work. Where consensus is not likely to work so, so well is in, in settings such as large political elections where we don't even necessarily sh share those goals. Yeah. Uh, just one more question, uh, I want because uh, we're running out of time. Which is uh, the the remark that you made uh, about uh, what had motivated King's uh, 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 original work um, raises, uh, uh, in conjunction with 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 the theorem, raises uh, some I think uh, very deep questions about uh, how economics uh, has proceeded because the Units in economists are uh, econo economies are firms and households. Uh, households are collectivities. Firms, as you said, are collectivities. When we model them, when we teach them to our students, we act as if these collectivities act according to a well-defined preference, as if they were a single person, uh, a a single decision maker. Uh, if there is no uh, uh, rule, no, no prep, uh, 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 a well-defined ordering, of, then are all the, is all the work that we've been teaching here wrong? <laughs> well, I... I <laughs> in, in a certain sense, uh, of course. But the, 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 que the, the question, the question of, is how how well does it uh, approximate reality? In, in in a formal sense, any economic model is going to be wrong because we always make simplifying assumptions, which uh, which which are not accurate representations of of reality. Uh, there there are. Uh, uh, there are certainly are cases, uh, and, and your, your own work, Joe, on, on, uh, on f firm maximization, uh, prof profit maximization, uh, where uh, the, the, the principal's textbook treatment is uh, very badly wrong. Uh, fortunately, there's more to economics than, than the principles textbook. <laughs> but there, but, the, but uh, in fairness to the principles textbook, there, uh, there are also settings where, where uh, that treatment gets it pretty well right, although not perfectly right. <laughs> well, I, no, I think there's two things. Well, one is that, um, one is a, 
a somewhat positive point, namely that, um, uh, you know, and it, it, it's true that in some economic, this kind of ordering is important. But it's not true of many economics where that's not important. I don't think one study of really serious problems in the world, uh, from unemployment, uh, need for uh, social insurance or medical care, etc., uh, all the way down to prevention of famines, turn on any ordering being presupposed. That's a positive point. The negative point is that I know what the kind of economic theory you have in mind, <laughs> but if it is wrong, and this may sound a bit negative, um, it's not just because it assumes <laughs> <laughs> ordering it <is> wrong. <laughs> there are many other, there are quite a few whales to swallow on the way. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, let me uh, thank both of you. Uh, and I also want to thank, before we conclude, uh, um, the uh, sponsors of the event, uh, the Committee of Global Thought, uh, the Heming Center, the Department of Philosophy, and the Department of Economics, um, and the Columbia University Press. Uh, the, these lectures are going to be published, uh, uh, so you can uh, read them, uh, meditate over these ideas, uh, in case you didn't get everything in this first pass. Uh, and um, I want to also especially thank uh, Rebecca Hogan and Adam Robbins who, from the Committee of Global Thought who put this together. And thank all of you for coming. <laughs>